Hello, and welcome to Writer's Group Therapy. I'm Tom. And I'm Roshni. We're writers helping writers with whatever writing ailments you might have. Whether it's related to your craft or your career, we can help. Are you ready for your session? The The doctors doctors are are in. in. So, Tom, what did you do this summer vacation? What did I do? I, I, th- it went so fast because we're actually, we actually ended our last season late, and now this, the beginning of our sixth year Has doing writers group therapy. Years? Oh my yeah, gosh! Yeah, it's been six years, and it, we started back early because we had so many cool things were going on. We had an opportunity to do a really cool interview. So this isn't even our actual first episode of the season. This is our second episode, but this is the first one where you and I get to catch up and talk. So, uh, and, and this is kind of my, uh, you know, like what you did on summer vacation episode. This is like what Hollywood did on its summer vacation episode, because we've missed so much stuff. Um, I thought we could chat about all these stories that are going down in Hollywood. It's crazy. It's like, I mean, obviously the industry never stops, but it was just like, whoa, I think like now that the pandemic's kind of winding down and everyone's going quote unquote back to work, it's like all the stuff that came up over the last two years and all the stuff we sort of put to the side, boom, let's do this. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hollywood wanted to kind of forget all the, the the problems it had while it was just trying to survive. Yeah. And now it's like, okay, things are settling back in. Now we have to bring up all these things again. Yep. And it's really weird. I think the first story we have here, which is um, about, you know, Roe versus Wade uh, being overturned. I didn't even think that would be a story that Hollywood had to deal with, to be honest. I was actually surprised. Uh, this hard, this headline is one big reason Hollywood hasn't begun boycotting states over abortion access. Well, to be fair, yes, it was going to be a Hollywood topic because art and politics always intersect. So, yes, it would be a topic in terms of people creating stuff about it. You know what I mean? Like creating films or creating, you know, content around it. But this has to do with the financials. Right. And companies didn't want to do anything because they get huge tax breaks from some of these states like Georgia. So they don't want to stop filming there because it's it's in their financial interest. But then their employees and their, you know, talent are, you know, trying to make a, you know, a political, you know, kind of social stand. So there's this conflict going on internally. Um, And then this is actually really interesting, just literally. Um, you know, that that story came out like a week or two ago. And then just today, there was another story that California is kind of making it a little easier on the studios because they're they're passing a tax credit, like a one point six five billion dollar film tax credit um, to draw production companies back to California from those states. So I feel like Governor Newsom's doing the companies a favor by making it easier for them to to ditch those states without having to, like, look like they're making a political statement and have other people come after them. Well, California had been kind of hemorrhaging anyway. I mean, we are the movie Mm -hmm. capital of the country, if not the world. And yet we were losing business because of these tax incentives. I mean, George has been a heavy hitter for, you know, what, at least a decade at at this point in the film industry, you know, so California had been kind of hemorrhaging anyway. This is a nice nice, I guess, quote unquote, nice way of getting people back. But it's interesting. Well, it's huge, though. It, that's that's it's yeah, I mean, there has never been a tax incentive that big. I mean, it's actually over, I think, five years. So it's not like one point six billion every year. It's, I think, three hundred million a year for five years or something like that, mm-hmm. which is still bigger than most states. You know what I'd be curious about, though, is. I mean, I understand certain um certain companies are really entrenched in Atlanta and Atlanta is definitely a hotbed for filming, but what, what would they do with terms of faith-based films? Because I do know a lot of those shoot in the South or in Oklahoma, you know, and some of them shoot in Hollywood as well, Mm -hmm. but that's definitely, and I I mean, these articles don't talk about that, but that's a, and there are people in Hollywood and in in the, in the industry that are pro pro life. It's, you know, there's California and Los Angeles don't have a, you know, an exclusionary factor where you can't be here if you're pro-life. So there's, you know, people with different points of view. So it's, it's, you know, complex. 
within even a, a single production, it's a complex discussion. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how the incentives play out. I think they are long overdue. Definitely bring back the work to California. I'm not just saying that because I live here. <laughs> come back, yeah. Tom. Come back. You know you want to. But yeah, like they definitely have needed these incentives for a while. It's interesting that it had to be political to get them to yeah. do it. But yeah. Interestingly, the Writers Guild was the only group that um, in the industry that called for a boycott um, of filming in states with abortion bans. And I guess they're kind of, I guess, you know, the Writers Guild, people, nobody goes after the Writers Guild, really, you know, like a state is not going to go after a Writers Guild, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, they don't care really about the Writers Guild. But the writers, you know, and maybe some of the, the actors might have, you know, strong opinions. Some of the, you know, if it's big name actors might have a strong opinion. So that could affect things. But I mean, come on, like, it's easy enough as a writer, and I'm saying this as a writer, to be like, no, don't film this thing. But some things like you have to film them in those places. Like Narcos does not work if you film it in Canada. You know what I mean? Like right. some things have to be filmed on location or you do a really good job of making it look like that place. Mm -hmm. So right. then writers really don't. Team. Yeah. Writers Second don't write unit. your stuff in Georgia. Writers just write stuff in L.A. You know, like that's the only way around it. True. So that was that's a big discussion that uh, it's been going on. It's going to probably be going on for a little while. Mm -hmm. Other things, Hollywood. What's the next one? Uh, digital creators rethink Hollywood as some push to own uh, work on their own terms. We've talked about this before. This is uh, this is the, the situation where um, so you're a, a content creator, no matter what you create, whether you're a writer, producer, artist, you know, TikToker. When you sign a deal with a big company they they own you you know it it it's it makes it's a very different relationship you know if if you're a you know doing your own thing like you're doing audiobooks and you're doing um you know voiceover work and you, well, as long as you're working for yourself you know or at least your you know or agent you know you have a lot of control over that but as soon as you sign a big deal with a specific studio or a company you know suddenly everything you create belongs to them you know, trying to leave them. It's like, you can leave, but you have to, you know, pay fees. You you might lose control of your content. You know, you might lose control of your entire social media campaign. If you're a TikToker, for example, you might be selling that and not be able to get away from it without losing all of that. And well, that audience this, is, is your biggest asset in that case. This one is a little bit interesting because in the beginning of the pandemic, there was already a push from SAG, which is the uh, Screen Actors Guild, to get creators in SAG. So traditionally, SAG has been actors. Um, when they had AFTRA, that was also journalists. You know, you can also be a theater actor or a variety show actor and, have you know, be a part of SAG as the sister union. And those are all live performers, but they're all performers except, you know, maybe journalists. Digital creators are their own thing. And so far, the acting unions hadn't touched that. But then digital creators started doing brand deals, which are commercials, which is something that mm -hmm. SAG touches. And now even you see agents for digital creators. But the interesting thing, kind of piggybacking off what you're saying, it's not necessarily, like as an actor, I am a hired gun. When I act in your film or I act on your video game or whatever, I am just doing that one commissioned project. But if I'm a brand, if I'm a digital creator, that's my brand. That's my, that's mm -hmm. me. That's my personality. That's my identity. That's my essence. So that's a little bit different. I don't sign away Roshni the brand when I do a film. You know what I'm saying? But digital creators are themselves. They are the brand. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Right. I, I don't know. And that's, that's the problem is that you're kind of like trading your life as an entrepreneur for a job with a company or a studio um, when you sign a deal like that. You give over your entire persona to them in exchange for all the resources and, you know, marketing and, you know, publicity stuff that they have. Mm -hmm. But you've already built, if you're, if you're successful as a, on, on social media, it's a lot of hard work, but you've already built it. You've already got the audience. You know, every time you do something, every, you know, you can get those sponsored, you know, videos, you can get 
endorsements. You can get, you know, a lot of them get freebie, you know, packages and gifts from, from, you know, uh, sponsors or brands, you know, they're, they're doing really well, you know, and, you know, when they have these, you know, 100,000, 200,000 views per video kind of thing, you know, they've already done the work to get there. So now, unless their goal was to get noticed so that they could do something else, they've kind of already got what they wanted, I feel. Yeah, I mean, I guess the only reason, and I'm not like a content creator. I'm not, you know, I have a YouTube presence and Instagram and all that, but I don't consider myself a content creator. The only reason I would think you would want to partner with like an agent or SAG or something is if they can get you better protections and deals than you could have gotten on your own. Mm-hmm. You know, if they can protect your, which of which is definitely something to think about, if they can protect your likeness and they can protect, you know, because maybe some of these creators didn't think about that when they were making stuff and signing away their brand deals and stuff like that. So that would be the only reason I could think of it. But as far as like, yeah, you're right. Like I wouldn't, if I already had built my brand and had millions of followers, I wouldn't necessarily want to team up with a company just to do it for them for like, you know, half the cut or something. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's another evolving part of the industry. So yeah. Yeah. Let's see the other things that are involving, you know, the COVID, the pandemic has, you know, put a big crimp into supply chains for all kinds of products and services around the world. And Hollywood has not been immune to that. It it turns out there was an article, Hollywood aims to trim production costs amid inflation surge and supply chain pain. So, you know, productions are already, you know, already criticized for going over budget and they're very tightly run. And then we had the extra costs of, you know, pandemic put on top of productions. And now they've, they're running into issues with, uh, you know, you know, staffing and, um, and uh, higher costs and, and dealing with all that. Meanwhile, they have all these unions they have to deal with too, so they can't really change too much that they're doing on the back end because they have contracts in place. It really depends. Again, if you're doing a union production, they are still following 2020 protocol, which is you have a COVID compliance officer, you get tested regularly, you have all the, um, what is it, the PPO, right? You have all of that Mm -hmm. stuff. Non-union is kind of back to 2019 levels where it's like, Hey, can you come on set tomorrow? Cool. And they don't really ask you to test. Some of them do kind of depends on how big they are. You know, it just, so it's, it's interesting. And I'm, I know the numbers are still bad, but we don't have the deaths that we had before. So Mm -hmm. I'm wondering maybe give it two or three more years and then the unions might drop the COVID protocols. If, you know, once COVID becomes something like the flu, but then yeah. we're having so many other, you know, monkeypox is coming up and there's like another one that they just announced on the news. I don't even oh, know. No, I didn't like, even hear about this. Stop. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. There's like so many more things that are coming up that you're just like, ah, oh, geez, like pretty soon we'll just have a compliance officer for every type of and disease. You want me to come there. back to Los Angeles. Oh, my gosh. No, but monkeypox is everywhere. That's not just an L.A. thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, but it's I'm not just, just, it's not just COVID. It's like, um, with technology becoming more integral to production, um, the article, this article went into how things that they're used in productions that are technological, like switches and electronics mm-hmm. are harder to get now. So they're costing a lot more or they're, you know, you're having to pay fees to get stuff shipped or f- flown in because it's taking forever. You know, the port of Los Angeles is undergoing another surge of, you know, shipment issues because mm. the ships for Christmas are coming into port and they, they're getting backlogged. They don't have enough truck drivers or trains or whatever it is to get stuff out. So now trying to get the the equipment you need and the, the technology you need for things like virtual filming and motion capture and vir- virtual production stages, those parts are harder to come by. So that can put your production into, you know, an issue of delay or inflated costs. I hate to say it, just CGI the light switch in. <laughs> do just it in post. In post. <laughs> well, the, you know they don't do it in post anymore. Like uh, the 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 virtual production is like the they call it the volume is what they called the one they built to do the Mandalorian. Mm. It's like the three hundred and sixty degree you know LED screen with the with the screen on the ceiling 
that they they build the entire environment for you know whatever planet they're on and have the monsters and aliens and spaceships or whatever running around in the space while the actors act to what they see on the screens and they film it all at once so they're doing they're doing the post production and pre production now cuz they need it to do the filming so it actually makes the post production go faster but at the same time it makes your pre production take longer um but then your shooting takes less time i guess it's really cool how they do it. If you've ever watched um, the uh, behind the scenes stuff on the Mandalorian mm-hmm. on the Disney plus channel, it's really cool. I definitely check it out, but, and it actually shows you some of the technology they're using and how they build it. So you can see where all this stuff, you know, costs a lot of money. And because it's becoming the new way to do it instead of green screening, um, this is in real high demand that people want to build these virtual sets, but now they can't get the project, uh, the, the pieces parts to do it because of supply chain issues and inflation. Oh, but I'm so old school. I do love practical effects. You know what I mean? You do, you've done some green screen, I know. <laughs> I have done, Green screen is surprisingly hard because you don't have anything to interact with. And that's why I like practical because it's fun to like hold it in your hands or interact with it, you know, in real time. I get it. If you have to do green screen, you have to do green screen. Or if you have to do virtual, you have to do virtual. But that would be... Yeah, a whole nother. Well, virtual is what you're talking about. Virtual, they get to they get to act to the actual monster, not a tennis ball on a stick, because it's going to be on the video around them. And they're in the environment and they're surrounded by whatever is happening. So, are you talking like 360, like 360 VR, like that? No, not exactly. That's that's a little different. In 360 VR, you're filming in 360 degrees. Um, in this, you're still filming from a single point from a camera, mm-hmm. but your environment is wrapped around you. So um, if you're, uh, you know, like I said, if you're on uh, Jakku, you know, the planet in um, The Last Jedi, you know, you're on, in the desert with the starship behind you. And here comes the TIE fighter in to blast you and you're running from it in the space and it's all happening around you. It's kind of like it's kind of like being in VR without the headset. You're kind of um, like a Star Trek holodeck, if you know what that is. It's like yeah. the environment around you changes so you can see what you're interacting with. Oh, so the actor is in the VR world, but the camera does not show the 360. The camera is only showing like what, 180 or whatever? I don't know degrees. <laughs> well, whatever the whatever the frame is of the filming. Yeah. It's actually the same technology they use for video games. So, mm. uh, yeah. It's pretty cool. If you haven't checked that out on Disney Plus, check out the uh, behind the scenes uh, on the Mandalorian stuff. It's really cool. Kind of funny that Hollywood's finally catching up to video games as far as like doing what they do instead of the other way around. Yeah, considering, and here's our next story uh, video game spending is down 13% uh, year over year. Um, they, they lost $1.7 billion over their previous year. Uh, in the quarter. And that's kind of huge because during the pandemic, it it took off like crazy. They got up to like, I don't know, 60 billion in 2020, which was 27% Mm -hmm. over the year before, you know, before the pandemic, the lockdown happened. Finally, the video game industry is cooling off a little bit from the pandemic. I mean, that's probably really why, because people are like, cool, I can go outside again. And, you know, Mm -hmm. just the same reason why they're like, oh, you know, streaming viewership is down and like YouTube viewership is down or whatever. It's the same thing. It's spiked. Even Netflix, you know, everything spiked because we were stuck indoors and now people are like, cool, I can go interact with the world again. So yeah, that makes total sense. I think it's changed the world though. I think, it, you know, it's, it's not going back to a hundred percent what it was before the pandemic. And we're still kind of in this pandemic to, for, to some degree, but you know, I think it's like for me, particularly me, I was not a big gamer until the pandemic. Like now I play games like every day versus, you know, once in a while before the pandemic. So it got me turned on to it. And I think there's a lot of people that are going to stick with it, whether they spend as much money on it because or how many hours they do it, you know, is going to be different. Same with streaming. You know, a lot of people, you know, who didn't have streaming platforms, you know, were looking for something new to watch. So they tried different platforms and, you know, Mm -hmm. they may have some that they still like. um, And there's obviously more choices now. But they they may not go back to their right their pre pre pandemic viewing, but it, it's uh, it's definitely going to subside a little bit. Yeah, it's going to kind of be in the middle. Like, I mean, I know we're not visual, but like, if you imagine that like gaming and streaming was at like say, you know, 
30 percent and then shot up to 100 percent during the pandemic. Now it'll probably even out to like 50, 60 percent. Right. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. They certainly expanded their audiences. So that's all great. And, you know, the audience for those kinds of things are always changing because generational things. We went through, you know, we went through the whole, you know, people just watching stuff on mobile and people only watching on computers and streaming. And I mean, if you went back 10 years, the the industry would look completely different. It would be like, and you wouldn't even have imagined that it would turn into what it is today. Oh my goodness. That's so true. Yeah. That's so yeah. true. And it changed really fast too. I mean, and in fact, uh, YouTube, I was just our kind of our next story. It was YouTube. Um, and I didn't realize this. They really took off uh, as far as a live TV streamer, you know, yes. the kind of like, basic cable kind of packages um, that YouTube and Hulu and Sling, you know, kind of put out there, like if you wanted to cut the cable, so to speak, um, but you still wanted live TV, those are the kind of the places to go, you know, supposedly we're saving money, but I don't know. $65 a month for YouTube, you know, is live TV thing seems like a lot of money uh, to pay just for live TV, but they got <laughs> up to something like, uh, what was it? 12.4 million subscribers on YouTube. Yeah. And this is after they shut down their YouTube Red service, which was their original programming. So they're just focusing on re, you know, rebroadcasting like what you would have gotten on basic cable for the mm-hmm. most part. I was like, did did anybody actually buy YouTube Red? <laughs> I guess not. I mean, like I would see it advertised, I'd be like, ah, whatever. But you know what's funny is, and people had already sort of predicted this, but I feel like YouTube's even overtaken, if not on par with Twitch, as far as like live streaming. And then you've got that, you know, live TV market aspect as well. Like, it's just, it's a really interesting, like, conglomeration of stuff. You know what I mean? Like, Mm -hmm. I honestly pretty much watch YouTube more than anything. And I think, I don't know if it's the convenience because, like, I can't watch TV easily but I, I mean, not mm-hmm. not that I can't watch TV easily, but like I can just put up YouTube on my computer and then go do something, you know, work on emails or something at the same time mm-hmm. versus like TV. I got to like park myself in front of it. So I don't I don't know what it is. It's it's a search engine and like an entertainment thing and like a who knows what else thing, like a highlights reel all in one thing, yeah. you know? Yeah, I I watch a lot of YouTube um these days and a lot of Twitch. Uh Twitch actually went from a little over a million to almost 3 million um uh viewers um from 20 was it was at 2019 to 2020, mm-hmm. you know, just over the first year of the pandemic. So, yeah, a lot of people, you know, took into alternative viewing stuff cuz they wanted to try new things and um obviously YouTube did pretty well in that in that space as well. You know, but that's that's YouTube's live TV thing. I, you know, YouTube itself with, you know, the user generated content, that's a, a magnitude more than that, obviously. Yeah. I'm not even sure what it is, you know, how you many know, I bet YouTube has. I bet honestly, the reason why YouTube and Twitch's streaming took off, especially during the pandemic, was the human element of it. I mean, not that you didn't want to like binge watch everything in netflix anyway because you're like the world's ending but it was kind of nice to be like the world's ending and there's other people i can talk to about it at the same time right so yeah youtube has like something like uh was it how many users 2.6 billion users in 2021 and that's hundreds of millions of viewers a day basically Mm -hmm. so they're still winning that that uh industry pretty well so and you know what else though i just thought about this youtube still has the old model of wait for it every streaming service you have to pay right to not watch ads some of them Mm -hmm. that show you ads now but the whole point of streaming was like cool like i can have this channel and you know whatever it's like the own thing yeah but youtube is sort of like the old broadcast model i mean i know it's not showing you know, shows, you know, Game of Thrones every Sunday at eight. But like, Mm -hmm. it's the old model of like, I'm going to put something on. So what if it's got ads, whatever, I can skip them. And then you watch your content. That's That's, the old model. But that's the old model. Unlike streaming where you pay for every single freaking app. And it's like cable where you're paying for every single channel. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. At least on YouTube, they did give they did give you the option to skip the commercials, and the commercials are generally on par with the content you're watching. I mean, it's always awful when you have a 30 second commercial on a minute long video, mm. but you know, usually it's not like that. And in those cases, at least the content creators that I watch, you know, I value what they put out. So I'm, I'm almost, I would say happy to watch a commercial, but I understand it. You know, it's like, these are, you know, this guy down in Florida who makes videos about SpaceX out of his, you know, his garage or whatever he does a lot of work to do that and put that information out there. And that's a source that I count on. So mm-hmm. I'm happy to, to watch that, you know, 60 second commercial and his sponsor message and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I haven't had pay, pay cable TV in, in a decade, I think at this point, even, even stuff like Hulu, you know, I, I, I stopped getting Hulu for a long time. I just got it cause I got it for my dad for father's day. So I've been watching some stuff on Hulu again, but even that, which is where, you know, I would get most of my broadcast shows, you know, I haven't really been watching as much. Honestly, like, I guess the one nice thing, I don't know if this is nice, but, you know, being home and away from everybody because of the pandemic, you miss that water cooler talk where everyone's like, oh, did you see, you know, XYZ show? But you're like, no, I didn't because I don't have Amazon. I only watch Hulu right. or something. So like now you just like watch whatever. But but that's where YouTube yeah. comes in there. After, after every episode of like, say, Stranger Things comes out, there's half a dozen people at least doing recaps yeah. of the episode, yeah. pointing out all the, the the Easter eggs and all the clues and stuff. So that's kind of your water cooler, I realized. It's, that's mm-hmm. where you go and you can chat with people in the comments. Um, if they're doing a live stream, you know, you can chat with people live, but that's kind of the water cooler now. That's interesting. I never thought about that, but you're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like literally after I go to see a Marvel movie, I'm like, I'm going to go look at uh, new rock stars. Cause I know, I know Eric Voss is going to be on there telling me all the things that I missed in the movie. Mm-hmm. And, and I think because he's so big, he gets like, you know, footage of the movies, like right when they come out so he can do his little videos, mm. you know, with clips from the movie. Cause otherwise all he's got is like the trailer. Yeah. Um, of course, he does a video for every trailer that comes out, too. That's oh like gosh. you take a two minute trailer and you spend 20 minutes breaking Analyzing it down. It. <laughs> exactly. It's it's hilarious. It's and these awesome. guys really put a lot of time and research into it. Yeah. So, again, it's another, you know, a way to get content. And, you know, it's almost like news, but in your little niche area of what you like. I mean, you can go online and find, you know, if you want to find out, you know, watch baking things, uh, you know, or or anything about like macrame or whatever. I'm sure you can find it. Yeah you know, it's this customized programming that you can put together. So it's really changed how people consume content. And, you know, I think YouTube's only going to keep, you know, getting bigger and bigger. And, and who knows if they'll ever get back into original content again, but mm-hmm. um, they certainly have the viewers. It's it's kind of funny, you know, that they never, it never took off with them, the YouTube Red with their own original content. Uh, I remember seeing ads for some of their shows and I thought, well, that'd be cool, but I'm not going to pay for it. <laughs> But I mean, and they I never think did. It, they I never put it, them on without commercials. Like yeah. they could have put them on there with commercials, and I might have watched it, but they never did. I think it works though because it is user generated, and it's like a smorgasbord of stuff versus like, you know what I mean? It's it's kind of like what network TV used to be, just everything. You know what I mean? And you're just like, oh, like I'll watch this channel or I'll watch that channel. Things are, have sort of evolved the same way like you were saying you'll watch uh what, what's his name the gentleman you just mentioned the new rock stars, the new rock stars boss. Yeah. yeah because you're like cool like i can get you know movie content on that it's the same thing like remember you know you'd be like oh well i want something family friendly so i'll watch cbs i'll watch something a little more cutting edge i'll watch you know nbc or whatever you know what i mean like you kind of every station you knew what they were you know fox mm-hmm. is really going to be edgy or whatever like you you just knew so it's kind of mm-hmm. the same thing in a way. It's like the new broadcast. Yeah, it's the the new world. It's yeah. here. And yeah. we don't have to pay for it. I'd rather watch the <laughs> ad. I don't want to pay for every straight streaming service. Anyway. I, I love it. I pay. I, we are different that way. I pay for Hulu without commercials. I pay for Disney Plus. I pay for Netflix without the commercials. Well, the, even if they get commercials, I'm not going to pay for the commercials. See, I think my thing about it is like, And maybe this is why YouTube Red didn't take off because, okay, so like all these streamers are pushing like, you know, 
Star Trek or like Disney is like, look at our old catalog or whatever. And if you buy it for the familiarity, you're like, cool, like with Disney, I know what I'm going to get because I've probably watched like 90% of your movies and TV shows, right? And the thing is, though, with something newer, like, yeah, maybe Amazon has some really cool shows, Man in High Castle, Mar uh, Mrs. Maisel or whatever, but I've never seen it. I don't want to spend the money and find out I didn't like it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, mm -hmm. Stranger Things looks cool. But again, I'd rather watch it at someone's house who I already know has Netflix and try <laughs> it out that way than spend the money to find out I didn't like it. Well, I think it's a low entry bar to entry. I mean, it's not like you have to subscribe for a year. It's, you know, it's not Spectrum where they're going to like lock you in, you know, for 12 months. Yeah, but like then it adds up because you're like, oh, I can only watch that one on HBO. I can only watch this one on Amazon. I can, I can only watch that one on Apple. You just haven't got a strategy. You know, my strategy is uh, I subscribe to one for a few months and then cancel it and then subscribe to another because the, because the shows stay. that? Well, it takes it, it takes a little effort, but you know, obviously, you you can always tell when the shows are coming out. You know, they're, they're always marketing it. See, they like people like me who will forget that they subscribed, and then like two years later, be like, "Oh wow, I didn't want the sub, but oh well." That they want people like me. <laughs> it's impossible to keep up with, though. Yeah. yeah, and and there are again dozens and dozens of shows that I've wanted to watch that I never got around to. And now with my attention divided across other, you know, platforms, I'm watching even less. I mean, even though I got Hulu again, I still haven't watched the shows that I missed for the last two years that I didn't have Hulu. Oh, I, I, still, I already I know I'll never catch up. catch up. I'll never catch up. Like, if there's yeah. something I wanted to watch, like, I either just have to do it or, like, forget it. I'm not going to. I'm like that with anything, any book series or whatever. It's like, if I didn't start, I probably won't catch up by this point. Yeah, I think it's my adult attention deficit deficit disorder, undiagnosed. You have to really want to sit down for an hour oh, or so yeah. to watch something. Oh yeah. You know, these days you're so distracted. It's it's not easy. It's well, it's, like it's not even distracted. Nobody's got time for that. To be honest, mm -hmm. you just don't. You know, and that's why mm -hmm. the old model of you know. NBC or ABC would like put out a show once a week on Thursdays at eight and you knew it was there. And if you missed it, you missed it. Like that was actually kind of probably better for our brains in a way. Right. And, and the fact that you know that the episodes are all there and that they're all going to be there gives you a procrastination complex. Oh, like, well, I don't have yeah. to, it'll be there when I'm ready for it and you never get ready for it. So you never oh, watch yeah. it. Like, yeah. so speaking right to that, I actually, and don't get me wrong. Like I will just say this right now, and this is not an ad or something like that, but I purchased um, a pass for Inkers Con 2022, which they are having live. I think actually it might be done by now, but they're having live things every weekend. And then they were, uh, they have a whole bunch of classes and you can access the classes for six years. So when I first got access to it, I was like gung ho. And I was like listening to a workshop like once a day or whatever. And then I sort of started to slide because I'm like, I have access to it for six years. So like, I don't have to watch everything right away. But the only thing that I showed up for were the lives any of the live zooms right. because I knew and even though they're archiving the live zooms I'm like I know myself I'm not going to go back and look at these programs again later I need to watch them when they're on otherwise I just have to act like they never happened so that's the only thing I've really been consistently showing up for is the live zooms so yes speaking to your point right there I am living proof of it I'm sure someone listening right now is going to be like when was this recorded? 2022? And it's like 2026 for them or something exactly. like that. Exactly. Yeah. They'll be yeah. like, oh, look at all this content on their show. This, I got to catch this, up this on. This historical story, this historical show about Hollywood from 2022, right? Oh, man. Too yeah. Funny. Well, now we're back and we're caught up. So now we have to look forward to uh, a nice, exciting fall of uh, shows and interviews we'll be doing. So uh, and uh, getting some more writing done, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We got some great interviews coming up. We got to catch up. We'll do a catch up episode, you and me. And yeah. we'll see what all what happens with all these stories, how they unfold. So follow us on social media at, at WG Therapy on Instagram and Twitter and come to writersgrouptherapy.com for more episodes. And uh, look at all our past episodes. We had some great interviews last season, too. So yeah. do check those out. Awesome. We'll see you guys soon. 